as a layman, I would now say, I think we have it. You agree? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Until today, the so-called God particle, the key to our understanding of the universe, existed only in theory, but not anymore. And when they made the discovery, they put the announcement out and all of the text was written in Comic Sans. And very quickly, within sort of half an hour, an hour, it was absolutely trending on Twitter, not that they had made this momentous discovery, but that it had been published in Comic Sans and everybody was in this meltdown about how outrageous and how it had devalued the scientific discovery. Even if you don't have much of a relationship with typography, you probably know a few basic things. Wingdings are kind of strange. Writing in all caps reads like you're shouting. And Comic Sans is the world's most hated font. But why is this typeface so divisive? The answer might not be as straightforward as you think. I'm Mikaela Marini Higgs, and this is Domestica Curious Minds, the podcast by Domestica dedicated to sharing the curiosities and untold histories of the creative world. Domestica.org is an online learning community where you can find courses taught by top creatives and connect with others who share your passion for learning. Because the secret to creativity is curiosity. From websites like Comic Sans Criminal to groups like Ban Comic Sans, which did recently change its name, Comic Sans is a typography that the internet loves to hate. At one point, there was even a petition to ban it, which had over 5,000 signatures. According to Alex Trochut, a graphic lettering artist who works with brands like Nike and musicians like Katy Perry and the Rolling Stones, It became bigger than anybody thought in the most wrong way. But I don't know, that's kind of like the funny thing about it. While Comic Sans might be divisive, its defenders and detractors can agree on one thing. It's the perfect choice for an invitation to a child's party. That doesn't mean it's a bad font. In fact, it kind of proves that Comic Sans does exactly what a typeface is supposed to. And even though its whimsical, cartoonish shapes seem a world away from the serious, blocky letters of Gutenberg's first printed manuscripts, they have more in common than you might think. After all, one of the fundamental purposes of typography is to communicate, not just words, but also meaning. Like the only problem with Comic Sans is it's bad use. No, it's bad design. Text is kind of like the art of wearing clothes. You need to choose what to wear in what occasion. And his Comic Sans is kind of like wearing flip-flops uh, on a wedding. But there are many situations where wearing flip-flops is the right choice. Imagine wearing dress shoes to the beach. Not very practical, kind of weird, and also just uncomfortable. So how did the typographic equivalent of underdressing become so overused that it turned into a punchline? In large part, because it's one of the few system fonts that actually looks like handwriting. Comic Sans is pretty much the only one that doesn't feel over the top or like you chose a typeface or like you were trying to do some really um, ornate calligraphy. That's Sarah Hindman, the author of Why Fonts Matter, who also runs type tasting events with the goal of making typography fun, exciting, and accessible to everyone. She says that because typography can sometimes be intimidating, this handwritten, friendly look of Comic Sans made it feel more approachable to more people. It was inspired by comic typefaces. It was also designed to be used for children, so it looks very much like a felt tip pen or a coloring pen. There are letters like the A and the G that will look really familiar to a child's handwriting because that's just how they write, but they're very different to printed or the traditional typefaces that would be associated with print. That resulted in it being used in some interesting places. 
On the internet, you can find plenty of examples of doctor's offices, sex offender notices, and even gravestones that look shockingly cheerful thanks to the use of the font. In the case of the announcement of the God Particle... When the head of CERN was asked, she explained, well, it's just she likes Comic Sans. It just feels like writing. And so that apparently is why they used it. There was an incident years ago when the Cleveland Cavaliers basketball team, LeBron James, was leaving the team. And the owner of the basketball team wrote an email uh, to the people of Cleveland, and he decided to use the Comic Sans font for that email. And it was a huge media storm. There was a, a bunch of hubbub over it, and, and, and people were going crazy. That's David Cadavy, the author of Design for Hackers and host of the Love Your Work podcast. So what do a physicist, a billionaire basketball team owner, and a kindergarten teacher have in common? Yeah, I do think that also part of it might not have been trying to be cutesy or childish, but might have just been trying to inject a little humanity into something that felt a little foreign and not quite so human when people were first uh, using personal computers and communicating through email. And yeah, and then it turned into a massive joke. And I've been known to write some things about Comic Sans my, myself about the shortcomings of the font. My personal opinion on Comic Sans is that it is misunderstood. I don't think that it's a good font. I'm not sure that it deserves quite the vitriol that it gets. That's because the impulse to create typography that looks like handwriting isn't new. When Gutenberg invented movable type in Europe, his first typeface mimicked something familiar, the handwriting of scribes. Though it doesn't really resemble what we imagine when we think about handwriting today, scribes had developed an alphabet made up of rigid lines that were easy to consistently reproduce by hand. Even though the printing press didn't have the same limitations as a human hand, Gutenberg still chose to replicate that style because it was something people already knew and understood. As typography evolved, new typefaces were invented and introduced, with many of them drawing inspiration from handwriting and old inscriptions. This is how some of the most common fonts we use today, like Times New Roman, were developed. Then came the computer. On January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. Though it's hard to imagine now, there was a time when computers existed in a professional context, but few people thought about having one at home. I think to understand why people hate Comic Sans, it really helps to understand where it started. There's differences between fonts that are designed for the screen and fonts that are designed to be printed out, especially in 1995 when you don't have 300 pixels per inch. You've got like maybe 72 or 96 and uh, 256 colors. And so really, you if you're designing a font for that application, you want to be using basically Lego blocks to design this font. It's going to be very jagged looking um, and that is actually going to give you a better reading experience than if you were trying to make it look really smooth. Finally, your internet is ready. With AT&T WorldNet, you can email friends. Everyone I know is on it. We've spent over $1 billion to create a state-of-the-art high speed. Check it out. It's my connection to the world. America Online, so Mm. easy to use. With the launch of Windows 95, Microsoft hoped to popularize personal computers. And to do that, they needed to make their software as user-friendly as possible. One solution was including Microsoft Bob, a program designed to make computers more accessible to children. The program looked like the inside of a house, and you could click on objects like the calendar or notepad to open their corresponding applications. And so to help guide you around this house was a little cartoon dog. This cartoon dog would communicate through cartoon talk bubbles. But when Vincent Conair, 
a member of Microsoft's typography team, opened the program, one glaring detail stood out. As he later explained, dogs don't talk in Times New Roman. If typography is the tone of voice we read something in, a cartoon dog speaking in Times New Roman is kind of like going to the gym in a tuxedo. So what's more appropriate to fill a cartoon speech bubble for a cartoon animal than a typeface inspired by cartoons? With comic books as his inspiration, Conair designed Comic Sans, but not in time for the Microsoft Bob deadline. But it did make the deadline for Microsoft 95, which sold 40 million copies in its first year. <laughs> With Windows 95, you can pretty much impose your will on your PC and the world. I feel so empowered. Of the new Windows 95 operating system. Suddenly, a lot more people had computers in their home, and suddenly, they had access to a new kind of typeface. So, yes, Comic Sans can be thought of as looking a little bit childish and crude, but that's kind of the point. People complain that it looks a little bit crude. Firstly, I would suggest that there is a hint in the name. It's called Comic Sans. There is no thick and thin to it, because if you look at a child's handwriting with a child's pen, that's, that's how you would create those letters. For perhaps the millionth time in history, type imitated life. And though it was created digitally, its analog inspiration, that felt tip pen, is where the font gets the design quirks that designers hate. Comic Sans does a really poor job of managing the visual weight across uh, large amounts of text. And that's kind of its main shortcoming uh, as a font or as a typeface. Picture a lowercase n. With a font like Times New Roman or even Helvetica, the curved line gets thinner right before it intersects with the vertical one. A lot of fonts are designed with the idea that maybe they were kind of drawn by a flat nibbed pen that gives thick and thin areas to the font. But Comic Sans and the consistently thick stroke of a felt tip pen makes for bulky looking areas where two lines meet. Beyond amateur graphic designers, this feature has made it popular with another audience, dyslexics. Because of its wide letter spacing and its irregular letter shapes, many find the font easier to read. While it's not the only dyslexic-friendly option, it's certainly still a favorite among many people who grew up reading it in school. I was talking to a teacher fairly recently and she was explaining that Comic Sans is a really familiar font for children because they're pretty much used to seeing it in their school environment from a really early age. But what this teacher was finding was if she used Comic Sans for teenagers when they were getting a bit older, if she was trying to introduce really difficult subjects, she was actually able to introduce much, much more tricky or difficult topics because she did it in a way that didn't make them look quite so imposing. While details like this made experienced designers cringe, that didn't stop people from using the font. In fact, Comic Sans' unique look made it ultra popular during the personal printing revolution. Some of the vitriol wasn't just that designers didn't like the look of Comic Sans, but also that it represented amateurs taking their jobs, or at least thinking they could. There were all these people who had all this publishing power and they could design their own flyers, which was pretty harmless, or they could design their own birthday party invitations, which was pretty harmless. But when you start hearing from a client that their 14-year-old nephew is going to be designing uh, their brochure for them instead of you, uh, it, it starts to grate on you when you start to see that, there's, uh, that there are people out there with the tools to publish things, but not necessarily the understanding or the design literacy. But can we really blame all of the bad graphic design of the 90s on Comic Sans? Cadavy concedes that if it hadn't been Comic Sans, the public, excited to be able to design and print for the first time, would have latched onto and overused another font just as badly. 
which I want to say is, is one of the things that I didn't think that I appreciated so much when I was a budding young designer, which was that I was living through this uh, very historic moment uh, right up there with uh, Gutenberg's invention of the printing press. As Comic Sans became overused and abused, hating on it became kind of trendy. Hindman, whose love of typography means she doesn't have a single negative word to say about the font, thinks that part of this reaction was to the font itself, but also... Part of it is just because it's fun. You get to be in the I Hate Comic Sans crowd and you get to make witty jokes about typography. This has created a lot of subtext around the use of Comic Sans. You can use it earnestly, perhaps oblivious to the hate, or you can use it ironically, making it a punchline. Yeah, probably Comic Sans is sort of like the, the flag of bad taste. It's like, oh yeah, everybody used it in oh, so many colors. It has remixed into something that is beyond what the designer probably intended, and it has crossed, you know, to a different meaning. So what's the verdict on Comic Sans? Should you use it? It's almost like a political thing where people have certain conversations and there's a script that they follow that uh, shows that they're with one party or another. Uh, it, it's kind of the same way with, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm hip enough to know that Comic Sans uh, is taboo, which, you know, I think the pendulum might swing in the other direction someday. And, 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 and sometimes you do see that where people might decide, well, Comic Sans is cool. I, I stand in solidarity uh, with this font because everybody else hates it. It depends entirely who's your audience, um, what are you trying to communicate to them. If your audience are seven-year-old children, then do your entire book in Comic Sans, make sure it's big enough to read. For older audiences, it gets trickier. In a New York Times experiment testing how trustworthy people found an article, depending on the typeface that was used, the people who read it in the font that looked most like the New York Times typeface, found it most believable. That makes sense because it was the right context. Those who read about it in Comic Sans found it least believable, again, which makes sense because this was in the New York Times. And my guess is if that you read an article in the New York Times in Comic Sans, you probably might think that it was spam or somehow um, somebody else had invaded the New York Times. Heinemann has found similar results during her font census and surveys where she asks hundreds of people to rank and respond to different fonts. But she's also found something else. I can prove, and I quite often do this with big audiences, I can prove that there are times when you will trust Comic Sans over other options. But when I ask people which school or which party poster at a school they would trust most, they pretty much always rate Comic Sans above Helvetica and above Baskerville. Next on Curious Minds. I thought it was a campaign that would last uh, two, three weeks. But you never know what's going to stick. In the case of I Love New York, it was totally unprecedented. From logos to love notes to capturing the essence of entire cities, our impulse to use symbols is what makes us, us. In our next episode, which you can listen to now, we explore where symbols, like the heart, come from and how they keep changing. Thanks for listening to Curious Minds, an original podcast by Domestica, where we're excited to share and celebrate our community's passion for learning and creative discovery. Follow us wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss out on any episodes. And if you liked this episode, please leave us a rating or tell your friends. It's really helpful. To learn more about typography or about hundreds of other subjects, head over to domestica.org, where you'll find online courses taught by some of the world's top creative professionals. And to check out all the strange places Comic Sans has popped up over the years, click on the blog link in the show notes. Thank you to Alex Trochute, Sarah Hindman, and David Cadavy for speaking with us. Until next time, stay curious. <laughs>